If you can remember all the way back to a week ago today, I did something rather unusual for me. I preached through an entire chapter of the Bible in one sermon. Buckle up, we're going to do it again. These two chapters fall together correctly. And as we come to Acts chapter 12, uh, it's such an interesting chapter of your Bible, and it really, I think, does fit very well for us to, to deal with it as one, as one unit. At the end of chapter 11, where we left off last week, remember Barnabas and Saul left Antioch, where the first big Gentile church had been planted? And they were sent to deliver an offering from the Gentile believers in Antioch to the Jewish believers in Judea because a famine was sweeping over the land. And this was a marvelous way to show the, the, the connection between Jew and Gentile, all one in Christ. Now, when we get to the beginning of chapter 13, the next chapter, Barnabas and Saul are back in Antioch, and the stage is set for sending Barnabas and Saul on the first missionary journey. Chapter 12 ends with, and we'll get there in a little while, verse 25, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Now, if you take that verse and stick it at the end of the previous chapter, you would never read through this if, if chapter 12 wasn't here, the first 24 verses. You read through everything else, you'd say, you wouldn't say, What's missing? It, it connects perfectly. But chapter 12 is here. And so this developing story of the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles is the, the big sweep of this. And to that end, it doesn't look like chapter 12 is even necessary. But it is here. Therefore, we know it is. Uh, it is inspired. It is uh, profitable for uh, teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, and it is all about uh, us being trained for every good work, being equipped for every good work. So we have this chapter here, and at the center of this chapter is a man named Herod Agrippa I. It is his 15 minutes of fame, more accurately and You'll agree once we see this, his 15 minutes of infamy. Chapter 12 is going to show us what to expect from government leaders. It's going to teach us, uh, an ex by example, well, how to pray better. It's going to teach us uh, from observing what goes on here to better understand and be reminded of God's sovereignty and His providence. And it's going to show us even more of the, the human side of the transitions that are going on as God is whittling away at things of, uh, of that are, that are carries o carryovers from the old covenant that need to be scraped away and the new covenant in, in force fully. So I'm going to start with, so I want to, want to do the whole chapter. I want to give you the cast of characters so that I don't have to stop a whole bunch of times along here and, and give you details. So uh, here we go. Here's the cast of characters for this, uh, this chapter. The main guy is Herod the king, Herod Agrippa I. He's a grandson of Herod the Great, the Herod you hear about around the birth of Christ. He was the one who got Rome to give him the title King of the Jews. And so when Jesus was born and these uh, magi showed up from Persia and said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? Oh boy, did the sparks fly at that point. He was the one who tried to kill the baby Jesus. He was a, he was a brilliant man and a spectacularly wicked man. Well, Herod Agrippa I was a skunk just like his grandfather, Herod the Great, but without as much clout. Herod the Great, well, he had a whole bunch of people killed, including many family members. One of them was his son named Aristobulus, and Aristobulus was the father of Herod Agrippa I. So the guy in this chapter, grandson of Herod the Great. Now, Agrippa I had gotten in trouble in Rome by getting into uh, serious debt. We don't know how he managed to do that, but he, he ran away to 
Palestine, and when he was there, he made some careless and unwise comments on the internet that got back to the ears of the emperor Tiberius. He didn't even have an internet, and he managed to offend the emperor hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So Tiberius threw him in prison. Then after Tiberius died, Agrippa was released, and there was still this, this heritage of Herod the Great being passed on through his family, and Herod Agrippa I was made the ruler of part of Palestine, what we would call Israel, where he was in power from the years 37 to 44 A.D. Now, because he was on shaky ground with Rome, it was especially crucial that there not be any trouble in his realm. He had to keep the Jews peaceful and happy and maintain their their tenuous loyalty to Rome, make sure that the tax money kept flowing uh, to Rome. And he found that one of the ways that he could uh, appease the Jews was to persecute the Christians, especially the apostles. And we're going to see that play out in the chapter. Okay, moving on in the cast of characters much quicker. James, the brother of John, he is one of the 12 apostles, along with his brother John. They were the sons of the man named Zebedee. They were the ones nicknamed sons of thunder. And uh, his part of the story in this chapter is going to be tragically brief, but you will see his name. Uh, the Jews refers to the leaders of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, and uh, they were primarily composed of Sadducees, but it, they held their power in this tense balance with the Pharisees. You're going to see Peter. He's our good friend, uh, Peter the Apostle. He's been uh, the central figure in Acts since the beginning. Then you're going to meet four squads of soldiers. Those are Roman soldiers, and a squad was four men. So these 16 were given the task of guarding one prisoner, Peter. Then you're going to meet an angel of, uh, an angel of the Lord, um, he is going to be dispatched from God, just like Hebrews 1.14 says, angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit uh, salvation. And you're going to meet a woman named Mary, the mother of John. She's the woman who owned a house where many Christians met in Jerusalem. And then you'll see in a minute who that John is. John is the one who was also called Mark, and he's a cousin of Barnabas. Are you getting all this for the exam? Um, we, on, in our daily emails, we're studying the book that Mark wrote, the gospel according to Mark, probably uh, Peter being his source for, uh, for that book. Then you're going to meet many gathered together. Um, that is a group of devout believers in Christ. They gathered in the home of Mary uh, in order to pray. Mary obviously had some wealth because she had a house that was big enough to be a regular meeting place for Christians. You're going to meet a, a girl named Rhoda. She was a servant girl in the home of Mary. Now, she wound up getting her name in the Bible, even though she's known only for answering the door and never letting the guy in interesting. Then there's James and the brethren. That refers to a different James. James, one of the half-brothers of, of Jesus, who uh, became the de facto leader of the church in Jerusalem. The apostles were sent out scattered, taking the gospel uh, everywhere. And uh, the, so it was a non-apostle, but a very close associate of the apostles. James, the um, the half-brother of Jesus that led that church there. And the brethren refers to whatever other apostles who were still in Jerusalem and the other leaders of the church there, like, for example, the deacons that we met in chapter 6 and uh, uh, whoever else it might be. You're also going to see the people of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were two seaport cities north of Caesarea along the Mediterranean coast. They were not part of, of Herod Agrippa's reign, but they did a lot of business with Galilee, and there was a problem in that relationship. You'll see how that tension getting resolved is part of this story. And then you're going to meet a man named Blastus. If you're pregnant looking for a biblical name, uh, there's one for you to try. 
He was apparently the, the treasurer, or it says Chamberlain in our translation, uh, serving under Agrippa, and he mediated a resolution to that tension with, um, with Tyre and Sidon. And then you're going to meet um, another angel of the Lord who was dispatched by God on the tragic final day of the life of Agrippa I. And then the last two names, Barnabas, same guy we've seen. He's everybody's friend. He's faithful. He's tireless. He's going to play a very big role in the coming chapters. And Saul is Saul of Tarsus, brought to the Lord miraculously after persecuting the church, Acts chapter 9. And he is soon, in, starting in the next chapter, finally going to be known as the Apostle Paul. Well, here comes Herod Agrippa I, 15 minutes of fame. Here's how the chapter goes. Herod murders an apostle. Herod arrests an apostle. Herod is overruled by an angel. Herod throws a tantrum. Herod becomes worm food. I worked on that one. And Herod can't stop God. Let's dive in. Herod murders an apostle. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, about that time, what time? Well, the time of the famine, a time when, uh, when Saul and Barnabas had taken that gift up to uh, Jerusalem. About that time, Herod the king laid hands, that means arrested, laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And again, Herod the king is Herod Agrippa I, grandson of the murderous Herod the Great. Uh, by the way, there's another Agrippa that we're going to meet later in the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul is going to be put on trial in front of Herod Agrippa II, who is the son of Herod Agrippa I, therefore the great-grandson of Herod the Great. Uh, someday I'll have to show you when we go through Acts the, the, the family tree of the Herod family, quite interesting and uh, intersects with the Bible in many places. Well, Agrippa figured out he could please the Jewish leaders if he persecuted their enemies, the Christians. Um, and so he went after an unspecified number, some, a number of some who belonged to the church. Uh, the worst case was one of the apostles. Look at verse 2. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Interesting, James, this son of Zebedee, was the first apostle to die and He's also the only one whose death is recorded in the Bible. Now, we have some, some uh, fragments of historical records and a fairly good idea of what happened to most of the apostles. Um, and interestingly, John, the son of Zebedee, and James, the son of Debedee, were the last and the first of the apostles to die. James the first, John the being the second one, and John went on to write five books of the New Testament. Now, interesting detail here. He had James, the brother of John, put to death. If you had a period there, again, like this whole chapter, you wouldn't say, I'm, I'm missing something. How did he die? Well, he was killed by King Agrippa. But with a sword, if you want to make anything of that detail, it could very well be that the Jews convinced Agrippa how they wanted James killed. The Romans, if they had a big-time criminal, how did they kill him? Crucified him. So killing him with the sword. Probably what's going on here is that those leaders of the Jews, in their utter hypocrisy, well, let's commit murder, but they wanted to do it in a manner that was quote-unquote biblical. Deuteronomy 13, 12 through 15, specifies death by sword for those who, who would lead Jews to follow other gods. And how much irony is that? They understood that Jesus claimed to be God. They just rejected the claim. So they considered him a, a, a false teacher, and therefore uh, James and all the other apostles were leading people to what they thought was a false god. Now, this chapter's here for our, our edification. What can we apply from observing this. Well, understand leaders of government quite often, more often than not, consider Christians either to be dangerous threats to their power or they discover that attacking Christians can gain them favor with people that they want to please. Don't be surprised when it happens. Now, it's okay to rejoice 
when the government doesn't try to kill you. Um, but government is never what makes the church holy. Government is never what makes the church uh, fruitful. And as a matter of fact, government in the hands of, of unregenerate people is almost always the enemy of the church to one degree or another. And don't make an absolute out of it, but that is the case. Now, secondly, Herod arrests an apostle. Well, he said, I, I hit a home run with that one. Let's do some more. Verse 3, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, that is killing James, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, it was during the days of unleavened bread. That's the seven-day feast that went on for seven days after the Passover. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So what he's doing is he wants to get the maximum PR benefit that he can by having Peter killed as visibly publicly as possible. Oh, how nice. So he, he assigns 16 men, four squads of soldiers. That kind of reminds me of the, 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 re, the arrest of Jesus, totally peaceful guy praying in a peaceful garden at night, and they send hundreds of soldiers to arrest him as if he's this dangerous, dangerous criminal. He says two words, and they all get knocked to the ground. Let you know who's in charge. Or uh, then Pilate placing the soldiers to, to guard the tomb. Well, each squad, four soldiers, total of 16 men. Uh, it looks like they probably, logically, took shifts of guarding him two by two, one at each side, and two others at the door. So they could have had uh, four different shifts uh, per day to guard him 24 hours a day until Herod could bring him out as a spectacle during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So what are we supposed to apply? What are we supposed to, to, to learn from observing this? Well, in our society, we have ones in power who want also to do evil things. We don't have any apostles to get arrested, but lots of Christians around that could be arrested. And we have people in power who are bent on making it uh, legal and convenient and, uh, and with, no, um, w with no shame attached to it to kill unborn children, people who want to um, lend, uh, live in mental fantasy land, believing there are multiple gen genders, people who want to be able to have sex freely with anyone at any time with no uh, unintended consequences. We have people that are um, getting more philosophical about it and enforcing the, uh, the, the ideology of, of DEI, that's the new acronym, diversity, equity, and inclusion, which means that we are diverse, we include all ideas and all people and give them equal, equal treatment as long as they believe exactly what we say they should believe and that they hate what we hate. Uh, it's, it's, we're living in a tough world. And... and we have our versions of Herod, even if not somebody with that much power. Now, we aren't yet being murdered and imprisoned here in America, generally speaking, or here in Idaho, but many of our brothers and sisters around the world are. Pray for them. And be wise, be prudent, be faithful, be prayerful, because the powers of darkness hate the light. And if you let your light shine for the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a target. And we're to learn from this example here. Well, the next one, here comes the happiest part of the chapter. Herod is overruled by an angel. Um, right at the time he was about to go make sport of Peter and make a spectacle of him, um, he encountered a problem, verses 5 and 6. So Peter was kept in the prison, and uh, prayer was, but prayer was being made fervently by the church of God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, so probably many meaning the night before he was going to do this in the morning, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, 
bound with two chains, so you get the idea, chained to one on the right and one on the left, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. So apparently two chained to Peter, two at the door, and then they would rotate the shifts. That sounds like a pretty secure way to keep control of a totally peaceful man. That is, unless you're actually fighting against God, and there's a bunch of people praying for uh, the release of that prisoner. So look at verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. <laughs> How cool would that be? You know, I've already been there for a couple of days. Every time you move, clank, 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 they fall off. And the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. I, angels are really cool. Um, you've probably never met one in person. I haven't either. Isn't it marvelous how an angel can just show up in the locked room, awaken one person chained to two guards sleeping between them, leave the other guys sleeping, and he can even cause his heavenly headlights not to waken the, the guards. Again, it reminds me of the guards at the tomb of Jesus. Remember, they became like dead men when the stone was rolled away and Jesus came out. This angel was very efficient in carrying out his, his mission. And, and Peter, he wasn't sure if this was actually happening or if he was seeing a vision. A couple chapters ago, he saw that vision while he was asleep, taking a nap and, and, or praying rather. Sometimes we fall asleep when we're taking it when we're praying. He was praying and he saw the vision of the sheep. He didn't know if that was happening again or just what. Look at verses 9 and 10. And he went out and continued to follow, Peter following the angel, and he did not know that what was being done by the angels, what angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When he'd passed the first guard, that would be right at his cell, and the second guard, that would be outside the, the uh, little area of the prison, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. You know, go ahead and be jealous, Yoda. The angel just said, open, opened. And they went out. They went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. So there's Peter outside the prison now, down the street, and his escort is gone. Well, what do I do now? Well, he realizes he's actually free. He had a pretty <laughs> good idea of a place that he could go. Apparently, these prayer meetings were a regular event. But then a funny thing happened to Peter on the way to see his friends, and he temporarily got left out in the cold. Good thing the angel told him to bring his cloak. angel probably knew what was going to happen because God had told him. So look at verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. What do you mean, thinking that the guy we've been praying for his release is released and he's outside the front door? What, are you crazy or something? But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. Now, there's a little bit of an insight here. Um, there's a superstition, many superstitions that were added to the Scriptures by the, by the rabbis. One of them was that everybody has a, a specific guardian angel who can take on your form and impersonate you. That's, that, that, that's crazy. But that was what they believed. There's an insight there. These were solid Christian people, and they had not yet been expunged of all the carryovers from their pre-Christian beliefs. Well, they still had that little superstition 
going on, and false beliefs and superstitions die hard. Now, I can't vouch for the state of mind of Rhoda and explain why she answered the knock but didn't open the gate. Maybe she had been told, look, um, Agrippa is in a really bad mood. Peter's been arrested. Um, Don't open the gate. Maybe that's what, maybe she had been told that. But then they tell her that she's crazy. Um, it it got to be tough for the poor girl. Um, but Peter wasn't going to stand out there all night, verses 16 and 17. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they mean somebody that went with Rhoda, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James and the brethren. Well, I guess they were amazed. What a glorious moment that must have been. And, and there must have been a commotion. Maybe they started seeing or something because Peter's motioning them to be quiet. Look, it's not a great idea to make a ruckus during the night when you have a fugitive from the law in the house. And I'm absolutely sure, if not at that moment, there was soon to be an APB out for Peter's rearrest. So Peter isn't going to stay there. He's going to disappear, make himself scarce. But before he fled into hiding, he said, report this to the rest of the apostles and James, the brother of Jesus. And I'm sure Peter wanted to warn them. Everything you've heard about Agrippa, yeah, it's, uh, it's all true. Um, be careful. So one more note. From here on, Peter is no longer in the spotlight. The only other time we're going to see him in the book of Acts is very briefly at the Jerusalem Council in chapter 15. That's not insignificant, but from here on, the, ter- the focus is on Paul. Now, Peter is mentioned in some other books of the New Testament, not to mention the two that he wrote, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, which are marvelous. But what are we to ap- apply from this? Well, does that mean that if you're ever arrested, just get a lot of people to pray and an angel's going to come and set you free? No. This is not a promise of miraculous intervention by God sending angels anytime that we're in trouble, only when He wills. But it is a confirmation of His power and His care for His people. He will get you where He wants you to be one way or another. Well, next point, Herod throws a tantrum. Um, It it turns out, apparently, uh, Agrippa was easily scared off from arresting more uh, apostles. Instead of making a spectacle of Peter, now he's got a a rogue apostle uh, running loose that he meant to kill. Um, So now he turns his murderous attention to his own guys, to the guards. Clearly, he didn't work very hard at understanding what actually happened, you know, interviewing witnesses or anything like that, didn't give any credence to the real explanation that this was the hand of God. And we know that the death penalty was normally in place for soldiers if they let a prisoner escape. That's going to come into play two other times in the book of Acts, by the way. On those later occasions, the the guards are going to be spared, the soldiers will be spared, but not here. Herod Agrippa was furious His plan blew up in his face, and boy, was he mad. So his solution was kill 16 innocent men. Then go on vacation to your favorite spot from which he often carried on his rule down in Caesarea. Look at it in verse 18 and 19. Now, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Caesarea is that place on the Mediterranean built by Herod the Great, spectacular place. Well, Agrippa was still in his foul mood. He just moved his foul mood from uh, one place to another. And now he has another problem. This one temporarily worked out a lot better for him. It looked good. 
Uh, there were those cities of Tyre and Sidon, not part of Israel, not part of Agrippa's reign, but they did a lot of trade with the, with the region of Galilee, where Jesus did most of his earthly ministry for about a year and a half or two years. And uh, Galilee was sort of the breadbasket that fed Tyre and Sidon. They needed each other uh, economically, and uh, their, their economies were linked. Well, Tyre and Sidon weren't under Agrippa's control, so he was very angry because this dispute was hurting the economy of Galilee, and Galilee was part of where his taxes came from. So, got to fix this one. And he apparently had, uh, somebody had caused some sort of a trade strike and hurting Tyre and Sidon, therefore hurting Galilee, therefore hurting Agrippa. Well, representatives from Tyre and Sidon somehow won over this guy named Blastus. All we know is he is a high-ranking servant of the king. Your translation says Chamberlain. Uh, they won him over. Well, how'd they do that? Maybe they were very persuasive and maybe Blastus was reasonable, but then again, he served a guy like Agrippa. More likely, they bribed him to get Agrippa's ear, and it worked. And we don't know why or how, but it, it set up Agrippa with a chance now to look good. And this is a Herod. He seizes every opportunity to look good. So, verse 20. Now, he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And with one accord, they came to him. And having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. The, the farms in Galilee fed Tyre and Sidon. So they needed the trade. Now, what, what can we apply from observing this, his tantrum? Well, those who are willing to murder and imprison Christians, they have no scruples about doing the same thing that anyone that doesn't, to anyone that doesn't do their bidding. Uh, Agrippa executed the guards, thumbing his nose at the power of God, and very angry with these people for uh, hitting him in the tax pocketbook, shutting down his revenue. Such people like that cannot be reasoned with, but they're in the world. Sometimes they gain positions of much power, the only hope for them is to be brought to new life in Christ. And as we have to sometimes live under their influence, be wise as serpents, gentle as doves, be circumspect. Well, Herod murders an apostle. He arrests an apostle. He's overruled by an angel. He throws a tantrum, and then Herod becomes worm food. The stage is set here, set here for Herod Agrippa to... He's thinking that something is working out really good, and he is happy to take all the credit. However it was done, Blastus did the hard work, and then Agrippa is happy to jump in and show off his pomp and his power. So look at it in verses 21 and 22. On an appointed day, that's the only day Herod ever did anything in public, I'm going to be out there, go gather a crowd, this is the day for Herod to show off. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now understand, emperor worship was part of that culture. We, we don't relate to that. So this isn't really a surprise but it's a bad idea. Remember, uh, Cornelius uh, wanted to worship Peter, and, and Peter immediately snuffed that out? Well, not so with Herod Agrippa. He was happy to let them say, the voice of a god. Now, if you've been to Israel, uh, and if you haven't been, you can look this up, you almost certainly have been to Caesarea, and you've seen this amphitheater built by Agrippa's grandfather, Herod the Great. The Jewish historian named Josephus, who was paid to write a history of this time of, uh, of the early church and the Jews uh, dealing with the early church, he describes the scene this way. Herod put on a garment made wholly of silver 
and of a contexture truly wonderful, and came into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it shone out after a surprising manner. God treated this pompous, proud, arrogant, murderous man in a unique way. But for one moment, they were crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, the way that theater is situated, the right time of year, yeah, the sun could come up and it could gleam off of the guy that's down there facing up to the, to the crowd where he's going to make his, his speech. And then this happened, verse 23. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. That might have been the same angel. It might have said, okay, let Peter out of prison, take a couple of days off, and then head down to Caesarea. I got something else for you to do. More likely, a, another angel uh, dispatched for that. Maybe this angel had, uh, had already served on the days of the, of the tenth plague and killing. Maybe he was one of those angels of death. Uh, we don't know. Now, I like you so much, I'm not going to give you the detailed biological description of what almost certainly happened to Herod. Here's the, uh, the lightweight version of it. He had obviously become infected with tapeworms. Words used here in the Greek tell you that. Uh, these tapeworms, <coughs> you get them from eating food that's infected with the eggs of the tapeworms. And they form cysts on the liver. And as they grow, as they multiply, when the cysts rupture, the infection spreads rapidly and the result is exceedingly unpleasant. And, well, it's, it's deadly. Josephus wrote that Herod Agrippa lingered for five days in excruciating pain. Well, the manner of his death illustrates God's view of such a man. What crime was he executed for? It's right there. He did not give God the glory. Read Romans 1, 21 through 23, and you'll see that uh, the reason all who reject Christ will be condemned is they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They did not glorify God for who he is. Now, after the coroner examined it, the cause of death was ruled angel of the Lord, but the symptoms were eaten by worms. That was a flourish of God's displeasure. So it says that the angel of the Lord struck him. The angel came. I don't know. Did this angel shine? I don't know. You know, Herod, Herod's in, Herod Agrippa's enjoying this, the sun shining on his shiny silver suit, and probably an angel comes in with blinding light, touches him. And I think the angel said, Psst, little tapeworms, Go! Five excruciating days followed by eternal torment. Now, what can we apply from observing this? Well, again, understand this passage is descriptive of what happened. It's not prescriptive for what should happen or will happen. And it isn't usually so vividly played out in this world. But understand it is true. Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. Or Jesus said, do not marvel at this, John 5, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Herod Agrippa will be resurrected to judgment. And in the meantime, he's in torment already. It's not going well for Agrippa. And it won't get any better. He'll be resurrected and sent to the lake of fire. But finally, understand, another reason this chapter is here is to say Herod cannot stop God. And fill in the blank, Herod, anybody else 
cannot stop God. As I said, the, the chapter ends with it all set up for launching the ministry of the Apostle Paul to the Gentiles throughout the Roman world. Last two verses, 24 and 25. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. Have you noticed every time somebody goes after God's people, you read a few verses down, and the word of the Lord multiplied, and, and many believed, and the church grew. Persecution, that's sometimes why there isn't so, as much overt physical persecution, because it causes the growth of the church. Verse 25, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who is also called Mark. They came back to Antioch. Next week, we meet in Antioch. We're going to launch Paul and Barnabas. So what can we apply from observing this? Why did God stick in chapter 12? We don't need it as far as the spread of the gospel to you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the, the remotest parts of the earth. But it's here for us to learn He is in control. His plans cannot be stopped. Even the worst that man can do cannot thwart God's eternal plan. Now, Saul, who was about to become Paul, hadn't even begun his overt public ministry to the Gentiles. He hasn't written any books of the Bible yet, but eventually he'll write Romans, from which you know these famous words in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You say, well, was that good for James to be the first apostle murdered? Well, yeah, for James. I mean, tragic for everybody around him, but he got to be the first of the apostles in the presence, with the presence of the Lord. Had a way to offer his brother to get there. That's okay. Look, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to the ones called according to His purpose. Now, all things includes the good things that happen to you, the promotions, the blessings, the, the, the children, the grandchildren, all of that stuff. And it also includes the murder of servants of Christ. It includes being unjustly imprisoned. It includes bad outcomes of elections. Have you checked to see how things went in this last round of Elections around here? Devastating for things like promoting murder of children and that. It includes wars. Got any of those going on these days? Natural disasters? Typhoon? Or some of our beloved missionaries work and all their stuff just crushed? God is going to cause all of that to work together for good to those who love God who are called according to His pleasure. If we remain faithful, we know that everything we see in this world, it's not the end of the story. We live in a world where there are lots of people in leadership and governments who are morally, theologically, spiritually, just like Herod Agrippa I. The church will grow. The church will be completed Jesus will come again, and all will be made right in judgment. How glorious. Let's pray. Father, thank you for letting us know of these last days of Herod Agrippa I. Thank you for including this in your word. Oh, Lord, please um, make us faithful. Some here are going through things that don't feel good, going through situations where truth is being twisted and maligned and ignored, where righteousness is being scoffed at and, and evil is being exalted. Oh, Lord, by Your grace, we will be faithful. Cause us to stand in Your presence blameless 
for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.